It is great to be together, and I just believe God is up to something really good this week specifically. He's been speaking to us, and we've been journeying through a collection of talks called The Church I See, The Church I See. And this is the culmination of that collection of talks. This is week four. This will be our last week. Next week, we're kicking off a new collection of talks. You're going to have to come back, bring a friend with you. It's going to be incredible. And uh, don't, I'm not going to tell you what it is because I love surprises, and I know half of you do too. And the other half of you doesn't, right? Yeah. But uh, today we're talking in the subject matter uh, of, of the church. Really, this has been the, the collection of, of conversations. But today we'll be focusing in on being devoted to be the church devoted to be the church. Now, the past previous weeks and week one, we talked about being devoted to know, knowing Jesus and making him known. These are declarations of our faith that as we move forward as a movement, as a church, this will be our language. Now, language, the lexicon in which we use really helps shape culture. Language matters, right? It, it may be in your home, there's things that you can say and cannot say, right? In, in our house, there's certain things you can't say. And, and what we can say to continue to move forward is that we're going to be devoted to knowing Jesus and making him known. In this, we understand that Jesus says, I will build my church. But in this, he makes a place and an opportunity for all of us to participate that we get to be the church. Second week, we talked about being devoted to declare. From one generation to the next, we will run our race, we will glean from those who have gone before us, and we will continue to pass on and, and allow the Holy Spirit to perpetuate the gospel message to reach those that are far from God and those who have not yet heard. Amen? And then last week, we talked about being devoted to the city, that we're not just a church in a city, we're a church for a city. That we want to be mobilized, engaged, and not just be uh, uh, limited to the four walls of this building. But to be the church, we need to be able to be mobile and impact at any moment. We free ourselves from being confined to four walls. And we liberate by God's grace to go and share the goodness of his good news. And this week, we're going to lean in to be devoted to be the Church. Now, we've said this recently that the church is both a place and a people. That no matter where you go, there you are. And you are the church. You are the bride of Christ. But as we gather together, the, the, the God gathered body of believers is the ecclesia in the Greek. This is the church gathered. And yet, when we leave this place, as we scatter, we are still the church. And we are called to be the hands and feet of God, that we are called to embody the empowerment of His grace but also put into practice the goodness of his love in this world. And so it's tandemed. He never called us just to be a, a, a rotary club that gathers and talks about Jesus to have no impact. No, no, no. We are called to be the people of God that changes this world. I believe the local church is the hope of the world. Anybody else? And so the church, we, as we are, we're devoted. The word of the year for us is Devoted. It's from Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says that they devoted themselves. Now, let's make this really clear. It does not say that their pastor devoted them. It does not say that their teacher devoted them, their small group leader, their spouse devoted. It says that they devoted themselves. And so there's the requirement of the individuality, but there is the collaboration of the participation of the greater move of God that we get to do it together. We're never called to do this by ourselves. We were always called to be connected. And some of you got these cool little Lego pieces as you walked in. Did anybody get, can you hold these up for me? Everybody grab them real quick. I got a pink one. And we're going to use these here in just a moment. I want you to hang on to these during the message. It's going to be relevant to our time today. But the church is something we're becoming. We're all in process. And I hope it's not just process. I hope it's progress. And the thing that we have to free ourselves from is the frustration of perfection. Did you know until perfection is lost, grace can't even come in. And Jesus took care of perfection on the cross in our place. So you and I need to be free from perfection. No, no perfect person's allowed here. If you're perfect, you got to go. Can't hang. 
No, no, no. We are all in progress. And in this, we all have a past. The prophet Usher said, I want a girl with a future and a past. Right? Usher. Only a couple of you got that. Okay, great. We all have reasons to think that we should or could be excluded. But let me just tell you, that's where God's grace comes in. And you and I need not let what we were stop us from becoming all that God's called us to be. And we will not be limited to the past, but we will leverage it to allow God to use it to create us into a more like image of his son every day. And as we learn who we are, we'll learn what we're called to do because there's a call connected to the creation that he calls us to be. And you and I are created in the image of God and we're created to be the body of Christ and to be an individual piece of the greater part of the body of Christ. But oftentimes we find that we would value certain pieces over other pieces, larger pieces. And that's a problem And because of that, the Apostle Paul wrote a portion of Scripture to a church. He wrote this to the church at Corinth, and he wrote this, and and now we know it as 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And this church had a specific design. Paul went there previously, spent quite a amount of time there, even helped plant this church previously, but now he's hearing of their diversion from the truth and the way that they were designed to operate, and he's giving some clarity and some correction. And so we're going to lean into a portion of scripture today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27. And, and just to preface this a little bit, this church had some issues. Now, if you're new and you have some issues, welcome. We have some affinity already. And some of us have issues. Actually, let me rephrase that. All y'all have issues. <laughs> but we are similar in this sense. But yet Paul, he responds to the problem with the promises of Jesus. And he says that what we have in him far exceeds any of our hiccups along the way. And he's going to give us some clarity and instruction. But previous to this portion in chapter 12, he's breaking down some of the hiccups and hangups along the way. He says there's divisions amongst you. You care more about a certain leader or personality than you do the person of Jesus. Some of you are more loyal to Apollos or Paul. But it's never about any single person other than the person of Jesus Christ. And he's bringing clarity back to this. This It's not a popularity contest. Jesus is the most famous and should be the foremost forefront of all that we do and who we are. He says divisions amongst you. And then he goes on and talks about sexual immorality. Now... We don't need to talk about that because that's not an issue today. Or maybe we should talk about it a lot more. (laughs) But these guys start making excuses about their lack of integrity. And Paul says, no, no, no. Jesus paid the price for all of you. That your sexuality should come into alignment with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the word of God. That we shouldn't give ourselves freely to anything other than him. That we should know how this works. For us moving forward. And then he says there's some food issues. Meat matters. Right? Come on. Where are all my (laughs) carnivores? Right? (laughs) And and he's saying some of you have, uh, some people have dedicated food to certain gods and then you're going and eating it. And the other people that are trying to really walk this thing out with Jesus are are getting all messed up. Don't be a stumbling block. But then he brings it here. And he talks about our gatherings, who we are as a church, and the purpose of our gatherings, that it's about God's spirit working in unity with order and and, and without distraction. The highest value should ultimately be about God's love. And the context is clear. He's saying there was one piece, one gift that was primary, that was constant, was the only thing that was Seen and known in the context of the church, he's saying, no, no, no. Let me give you a clear illustration of why this shouldn't be. And he goes into the conversation and he uses the illustration of a body. Now, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And the title of my message is, look at that body. I'm just kidding. That's not, that's not the title. 
I work out. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> That's the problem. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 12, it says this, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body, form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many parts. So he's giving an illustration, and within this illustration of the body, he's given two subpoints already. He's talking about baptism and drinking of the spirit. He's talking about immersion and saturation. He's talking about the spirit of God, the, of Jesus, is the commonality and connection point for all of us. He says, you, like Legos, are made to connect together. Lego. Okay. Verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Can you imagine if we were all an eye? We'd be like Mike Wazowski. <laughs> if they were all one part, where would the body be? So what it is, there are many parts but one body. Verse 21, it says, the eye cannot say. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help it. The eye cannot say to the hand. I feel you, bro. <laughs> I'm Sorry. He says, I don't need you, and to the head. Let's think about this for a moment. And the head cannot say to the feet, south side, walk it out. East side, walk it out. He says, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving honor, giving great honor to the parts that, it, that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body. But that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And now Paul bookends this, and he brings it back to verse 27. He says, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. He, he's helping us understand that we are created for connection, and the cause of our connection is the concurrent, consistent part of our connection, and that's Jesus Christ. He's pointing us back to Jesus and why he's calling us to be a body of believers. And in this, I want to give us some practical understanding of how we are to continue to live this out. And the best way for me to do this is to break this down into four quick points. And my first point is this. Number one, if you would, write this down. Number one, we need to be devoted to belong. You and I are created for connection. Now, when it comes to this thing called Legos, um, Legos are a great gift until they're a curse. I love it. All different shapes, colors, sizes, functions, and attributes, right? And just like people, we all have different backgrounds, cultures, upbringings, expressions, ethnicities. And God has yet seen, and more than that, created the design for us to connect together. He thinks we're better together. And I do too. And just like my kids, come on, I have three beautiful little tax deductions. Children, children. Come on, you're thinking about it too. Did you get your W-2 yet? And my kids love Legos. And the cool thing about Legos is that um, they build great things. Matter of fact, um, they even come in so many pieces that, that now I see, how, I go to look to see how many pieces there is before I even try to engage in the conversation. I see Legos come out at Christmas time and I look at my family members that gave them to them and I think, I am never giving you a gift again. 
Because the kids aren't going to put these things together, man. I am. <laughs> but my kids love it. They want it. They want to play with it. They want dad to help. Dad, dad, I got a Lego thing. I'm like, 792 pieces? You are never to speak to your aunt again. <laughs> and Legos are great, right? They have all these different shapes and sizes. And yet when my kids want them to function, they want dad to put them together. When they fall apart, they want dad to fix it. When there's a missing piece, they want dad to find it. But here's what Paul is telling us as a church, is that it's not the father's role to make it function. It's not the father's role to fix it. It's not even the father's role to find the missing pieces. He says, that's the children's role, and I've given them all the instruction they need to piece this thing together because it works perfectly. All the different colors, all the different expressions of the beauty of God's likeness, and we cannot limit this to a certain piece and make this more prominent because what you can build with the same piece will constantly present as a problem if we don't have the overarching understanding that each piece plays a special part and it is integral and essential to the body of Christ and your peace when it's missing is a problem but we think too many times we think well I'm not pure enough I, I, I can't produce this is not about your purity or your producing the Bible says to abide in Jesus and that's how we produce the fruit of our life is about what we're connected to it's not about what you produce it's about what are you willing to provide are you willing to provide your peace to be devoted to belong because we were created for connection. Even in God's design, in the book of Genesis, God spoke and it was. He spoke and it was. In his creation, he spoke everything into existence until he got to humanity. He now, in his likeness, he created all of us. He says, we are the image bearers of God. But when it came to the creation of humanity, he said, I've got to touch this. I've got to get my hands on this. And the way we were created was from a touch for a touch. The way he's created us is to connect. And the tangible expression of the presence of the image bearers of God are the person sitting next to you and around you every day. And some of you don't like that. Because all of our problems are connected to people. I have a friend who's a pastor. He says, ministry would be easy if it wasn't for the people. I said, brother, you might, you might consider another profession. <laughs> and some of you need to know that you're going to hate heaven if you don't love people. Because it's packed. But the connection point is always at the center of Christ and connected with people. Why? Because the greatest showing of God's grace came in the form of a man. His name is Jesus Christ. And the greatest grace continues to come forward today through mankind. And you and I cannot become more like him if we are isolated and segregated. We cannot become all that he's created us to be because we will flow with the currents of this world. So how do we combat that? We've got to be committed to one thing. Paul says it here in verse 12. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. He says, Jesus. It's got to be Jesus at the center. It's got to be Jesus at the core. He goes on and, and helps us understand that Legos, like people, are made to fit together. And they fit together so good that it's even hard to take them apart once they're connected. Come on, any parents know the realities of Lego? And you have broken a nail or you have bled in your finger because your children said, Dad, I can't get this one apart. I was like, throw it away. Just throw it away. <laughs> I made the mistake of going get the butter knife. Yeah, I went to the ER. Right. But, but in my world, I had this gasalt, this awakening to my reality 
that there is a device that was introduced and it became aware to me about a year ago that there's this thing called a brick separator. Yeah, girl, you already know. I'm going to put this on a keychain and sell these. $27.59 a piece, plus shipping and handling. But a brick separator. This thing is the tool. Do we have the picture? Pull it. This thing is so, look, look what it does. Whoop, there it is, right? <laughs> and, and this thing separates them really easy. And I don't have to bleed over these things anymore. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But the attributes of the brick separator, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, there's the front end of it. It's called the wedge. This slides between and separates the pieces that joined and locked together, right? Then there's the lever part. Connects at the center and pulls up to separate. But then there's the top piece. It says it's a pin remover. And this, this pops the axles and the tires off and takes away those portions of it. And let me just say this. Maybe you're already going there in your mind. But there's only one of these and many of the pieces. And in our natural world, that presents a problem. But I'm going to share with you the shadow side of this in this illustration. Is that there's only one adversary, one opposition, one devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he would love to be a wedge and divide. He would love to come in and be the lever and lift you up to separate you, to make you think you're elite and better than somebody else. He would love to take off the wheels of the power of the church to move forward and pop the axles off this thing. The devil is no dummy. He is crafty, and he's coming for the church. But guess what? His power pales in comparison to the power of Christ. But you and I have to be connected to the same source. And it's Jesus and Jesus alone. We cannot find ourselves going in the waves and being removed because we find ourselves fighting a battle that we were never intended to fight. No, friends, don't take the bait. Don't get distracted. We are the church. We're becoming the church. We are becoming more of the church every day. We need to be devoted to be the church and the church that he sees. And the way that we do this is we understand that we are devoted to belong and we are created for connection. Number two, if you would, we also need to be devoted to be one. Unity, not uniformity. Paul keeps breaking it down in verse 13 and 14. He says, for we were all baptized by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many parts. We have to stay committed and connected through Christ and be devoted to be one. And unity is not uniformity. Because it would be really weird if this place was packed out with a bunch of white men with hair slicked back in jean jackets wearing some swaggy sneaks. The beauty of the expression of God is not in the sameness, but it's in the distinctness. The beauty of the expression of God is held in the image bearers of God. And I don't know if your eyes are unable to see, but if you look around, that beauty is expressed in a myriad of ways. And unity is not uniformity. We don't all have to talk, act the same. We don't all have to come from the same pedigree or past. Come on, God knows he's got a purpose and a plan for every person. That the grace of God is good for everyone, slave or free, no Jew or Gentile. Come on, this, this should give us a greater reality that the church should be on the other side of reconciliation and willingness to have hard conversations. This is who we are as the bride of Christ. This is a gospel reality. It's one thing to come together. Because I think we can all come together for an event. It's another thing to be connected together and be committed to be better together. And our connection has to be stronger than the current. And that only can happen when it's at the center connected to Christ. John chapter 17, verse 20 says, My prayer is not for 
them alone, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, Legos are great. My kids were given a bunch of Legos when we moved into a house several months ago next door to my aunt. My aunt, she had a, a, a stack of boxes of Legos from my little sister. She's, she's 34 now. I don't know if she's playing with Legos as much these days. No judgment if she is. But she gave these Legos to my kids, and there were four boxes. It was red, it was black, it was yellow, and it was white. And she goes, here, let the kids have Legos. I go, gee, thanks. More Legos. Awesome. But, but I got a little CDO. Anybody else? Forgive me. OCD. CDO is the order in the alphabet they actually go. So if you really feel me. And so I gave these to my kids. I was like, kids, go ahead. Play with these. Here's some more Legos. But when you're done, put them back in the right box. Guess what my kids did? They didn't do that. They messed the whole thing up. It's like, what's wrong with y'all? And my wife is like, calm down. I was like, you calm down. I said that in the bathroom by myself. I didn't say that to her face. I won the argument when I was by myself. <laughs> but the problem is, is oftentimes we want order. And, and Paul is giving us the understanding of order. Order is not about uniformity. They don't all have to be in one mono-ethnic environment. No, no, no. We're better together. He says unity is not uniformity. God created us to be image bearers. And the image of the expression of God that you bear is essential to be the body of Christ. That there's special pieces and people that play special Parts, But oftentimes we get consumed with, well, I don't look like this. Well, friends, I'm so glad that you don't. Because in God's expression, the beauty is not limited to one shape, one size, one function, one color. I have a picture of my daughter. She put together a little, little illustration for us this week. Isn't she beautiful? But she will help us understand that there is such beauty in diversity. There's such a beautiful expression of color and shapes and functions that it's not limited to just one, but it's gotta be more vast than this, amen? We are to embody our design and finding the misses, missing pieces will help us understand our place because when more pieces are added, there's more value for those that are missing. You don't know how essential your toe is until you lose it. Balance goes way up in the absence of a toe. Matter of fact, you might even not know you got two pinky toes until you stub that thing. And then you're saying things in a known language that you need to repent of later because of the pain that you endured. And the problem is, is that we don't realize the value until the vacancy or the pain that we endure through the problem of not committing to being one in Christ. We need to be devoted to be one. And this is not uniformity. This is unity in Jesus. And I tried to enjoy Legos with my kids. And it's not fun. It's a lot of work. But let me tell you, the byproduct is a beautiful expression of God's creation. He knew on the front end, this is how I designed it to be. Now I give you all instruction to help implement how it should be. Amen? Number three, if you would, number three is this. We need to be devoted to be better. Have an attitude that honors all. Uh, there's an old saying that attitude isn't everything, but attitude is the difference maker. When you ask me what's the number one key to, to leadership and development, what would you like to have on your team? I don't care how gifted or talented or resourced you are. If you don't have the right spirit and attitude, it's not going to work out. Attitude is essential. And like a bad attitude, it, it can be related to a flat tire. Something has to change 
before we go anywhere. <laughs> and when we realize that attitude plays into and is such an integral part of what it looks like for us to be the people of God, we can commit to coming to this place and saying it's more about Jesus than it is my preferences or what it would look like in my opinion. Did you know God, our God, the God of the Bible, is one God distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He has different personality. He is completely co cohesive and connected and at peace within himself. And yet, oftentimes, in our expressions of personalities, we can't even have two people having a discussion to make a decision to move forward without an attitude. My kids, when they have an attitude, before I realized what it meant in the biblical context, I used to tell them, don't you have an attitude? Don't you dare have an attitude. If that was the case, if I wanted to walk around all day, every day, tell them don't have an attitude, I could do that every day, all day. Anybody with me? Any parents? Hello. But now, in the biblical precedent, we need to understand that Paul writes, and he says this to the church at Philippi, he says, it's not about not having an attitude, it's about having the right attitude. He says, we need to have the same attitude that is which is Christ Jesus. We need to have the same attitude that is Christ Jesus. And here's how we do so. We are committed to become better every day. That you and I don't become better by trying to become something different, we are who God created us to be. We're the image bearers of God. But in this, the way that the Holy Spirit moves is he reveals inside of us his power internally before it's expressed externally. And when we understand the power of what's working in us, things around me don't have to change for me to have an internal aha and difference in posture and position when it comes to the move of God, when it comes to being the body of Christ, when it comes to participating as the body of Christ. And we can celebrate our differences in a lot of respects. The Bible says when, 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 when you get married, one man and one woman, in this it says that the two become one flesh. Which one? Well, it just matters who won. <laughs> and we usually have this wrestle, right? I, I, I'll do a marriage, and we'll, we'll journey for a while, and, and about a year and a half into this thing, I'll get a call. Pastor, man, pray for my husband. I'm like, girl, I already been. I met you. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. <laughs> but the problem isn't which one or who won. It's that we have to be one, and the two have to decease, and a new life has to arrive in Christ. It has to be the, about the one, not which one. We have to choose our attitude in this, how we honor and revere God's creation. He says every specific person has a plan and the power of God anointed on their life. By my grace, I've given them distinctness, uniqueness. I've called them to be collaborative in the approach and no other place on the planet where these people be sitting in this place to be connected other than Jesus Christ and the church. We have the most common of all commonalities, and it's the core of who we are. And things don't have to change on the outside for us to have an understanding on the inside that my small part plays major in the great big picture. And if you can't, haven't seen or don't understand yet how your peace plays in, friends, let me help you. We have this thing called growth track, and we do this thing called gift discovery. And just because you're not the guy that stands on the stage or the friend that is incredible in the drum cage. I keep asking Josie if I can be uh, one of the worship people. Loving you is easy cause you Yeah, yeah, just stop. Your unique gift is essential and you and I have to learn how, how to honor all. Again, Paul here in verse 15, he says, now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, Mike Wazowski, 
Where would the sense of hearing be if the whole body with an ear? ear would the sense of smell be no the problem is this is we start to take the bait of satan and have a bad attitude and we start thinking things like because i'm not like them they don't need me or we put ourselves in a different position and we say because they're not like me i don't need them and the problem is is that we are made to fit together (laughs) different shapes sizes colors background experiences exposures in life And trying to make things fit in a way that doesn't seem to function can become frustrating. And friends, if you found yourself in a place where you don't understand how you fit, we just haven't found your specific place yet. You have a place in the body of Christ. We need to be devoted to believe, to belong, to declare that God's good and he's with us and he's created us all to connect. There's a place for everyone. There's a perfect functional place for every piece. A piece put in the wrong place will feel it. It doesn't mean that that piece doesn't have value. It means that that has a special value and there is a special function. And without that piece, we are not uniquely, distinctly the person of Christ, the body of Christ. We're not the expression of Christ in its complete form. And for us just to lose a piece of our body, you would know that would be, that would be bad. Fourth and finally, and I'll conclude with this, is that we need to be devoted to be bold, to care for and connect more. Verse 25 and 26, it says, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. We have to be bold to connect and to care for more. And it takes something more than bravery. It takes a boldness. And the boldness is not something that we create or manifest on our own. This is the power of the working God in the manifest form of the Holy Spirit. At the beginning, we talked about Acts 2, 42, and it says that they devoted themselves right? You know how they had the power to devote themselves is that they had the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8 previous to this it says that the Holy Spirit is their empowerment but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. What are we witnessing to? We're witnessing to the love of Jesus. We're witnessing to the unity of Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He and I, we are one. Let us be one and let them believe our message. And the only way that people are going to receive our care and come to connect is when we are consistent and willing to be bold. We can't be limited to this environment alone we have to be empowered by his grace to continue to go john 13 35 says it like this by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another and we miss it we miss it when we think the piece that i play is more important than any other piece and then we start to think or realize that big pieces are wait a minute They're more common. Specialty pieces should be the priority. We also miss it when we think my piece doesn't matter. And the problem with the the sin of pride is it presents itself in an outward expression of I'm better, I'm too good but it also presents itself in the inward expression of I'm not good enough. But friends, Jesus died on the cross so that all could come, so that all could receive, so that all could have the care, the connection, the touch point, so that we could all understand and be encouraged. Like the author of Hebrews, the writer says it like this in, in Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 24 and 25, he says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. What he's saying is this, is that the people that come together are the church gathered. This matters. This is essential. Don't stop gathering. You got to get encouraged. You got to get built up. Come on. Aren't you so glad you're part of a life-giving church? Aren't you so glad that you get to connect with other people that you wouldn't connect with otherwise? Aren't you so glad that God's spirit is in this place permeating and saturating our souls that we get to gather for the building up but we get to scatter for the dispensing of going out that we get to come together to care but we get to go so others too can connect because the maker the originator the one that designed us made us and saved us has created all of his image bearers to have a connection that he's called us all to come to a place of being in the body of Christ because that's his design that's his plan when you're God you can make the rules we don't just go to church we are the church and why this conversation matters so much is because when you have one brick, one piece, same color, same size, same attributes, same functions, the only thing you can build with it is a wall. One color, one size can only build one thing and that's a wall and that's not God's world. It should not be and will not be limited to one expression. Paul's telling the church at Corneth, you guys have one priority on one gift. He's like, no, 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 there is many gifts in the body and be consumed with it. My daughter plays a recorder and my daughter playing the recorder by herself is cute. And two kids playing recorders is curious, but three or more, that's a curse. And he's saying, you can't have a beautiful band limited to one expression, one gift, one talent. It has to encompass more. It's made for more. And God gave us the plan. He says, like Legos, you're better together. You're made to connect. And he's called us not for the Father to make it function or to fix it or to find it. He says, here's the instructions. I know how I designed it. It is designed to function. And if it's broke, oh friend, I already knew how to fix it. Jesus. And if there's a missing piece, we're going to find it. So run and tell that, homeboy. We're going to find you. And like one theologian says, the hound of heaven is going to hunt him down. And here's how he does it. Here's plan A. It's always been people. God came and died for the sin of the world. The sin was you and I. And in our reception of the greatest gift we will ever know, grace, we are not now limited to being receivers. We are now the dispensing agent that he would use to saturate, immerse, and saturate the souls of those that feel like they're on the outside. Amen. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes. This morning as you hear these words, I just want to encourage us as we conclude to understand why we need to live this out. Because we are the people with the unique gifts. We are the people with the different opportunities. We are the people who carry his presence. And at the very conclusion of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. And then he goes into 1 Corinthians 13, that's all about love. This is how the world will know. And it starts with me and who's in front of me. And we gotta be willing to devote ourselves devoted to know, devoted to declare, devoted to the city, and devoted to be the church. The church I see, 
the church we see 